Meguiar's presents Car Crazy, the show that focuses on the people behind the cars. Most kids like to play with cars, but for some, it becomes an obsession. This type of person, and there are millions of us, have an unusual preoccupation with cars. And sometimes it is not at all rational. Indeed, we are talking about people of all ages and all walks of life who are certifiably car crazy. Hi, I'm Barry McGuire, and I've spent my entire life working and associated with people who are crazy about their cars. This show is intended to gain insight into these people and understand why they are so car crazy. It's been called a contagious disease, and we hope this show will help you catch the bug, if you haven't already. We have a lot to show you today on McGuire's Car Crazy. It's interesting that so many of the parts that make our cars run great today were originally created for hot rodders. Today we're gonna to sit down with a man who is known as the father of fuel injection, Stu Hilborn. Then we'll talk to the cam father, Iski Camshaft's own, Ed Iskandarian. Next we'll hear from some of the diehard Corvette owners celebrating Corvette's 50th anniversary at the Peterson Auto Auto Museum. And if that isn't enough, we'll chat with some of the people behind BMW Films Hire Series. So stay tuned, McGuire's Car Crazy, we'll be right back. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. Known as the father of fuel injection, Stu Hilborn created the first working model of fuel injection while racing in the early days of hot rodding. He became hooked on racing on his very first visit to the Muroc Dry Lakes in the late 1930s and never looked back. He went on to race a streamliner with much success, then gave racing a try at Indianapolis. Cars with Hilborn injectors have won at Indy a record 34 times twice with celebrated racer Bill Vukovic behind the wheel. And now the fuel injector is used on the overwhelming majority of cars produced today. We sat down with Stu Hilborn to find out how it all began. What an honor it is to be here with Stu Hilborn, the father of fuel injection, one of the great pioneers of the hot rod hobby. Stu, great to have you with us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. How did this love for cars first begin? Uh, I didn't really have any particular love for it until uh, uh, one year, one of my friends uh, wanted to go up to the dry lakes in California and watch some, the roadsters and hot rods run. So um, he took me up there, and I was fascinated to see all these old cars around there. Because, you know, in those days, the uh, passenger cars uh, from Detroit were not even able to go 100 miles an hour. Nobody could. So when we get up there and I see all these cars running over 100 miles an hour, and, what year do you suppose they first began racing on the dry lakes? Oh, I know what year it was. It was 1939. Really? Yeah. A fellow named Bill Worth had a streamliner that he wanted to sell. So um, I went down to his house to pick up the car, and that was on uh, Pearl Harbor Day. Really? I didn't know anything about it until we right. heard the news over the radio. Is that right? So I went ahead and bought the car, but uh, the next year uh, the racing shut down, and we didn't have any more racing, so... I had to put the car in storage until after the war. And uh, it was while I was in the service that I came up with the uh, idea for the fuel injection. Really? Yeah, because uh, we all ran methanol up there for fuels, and it doesn't work very well with carburetors. It attacks the metal, eats holes in it. It produces a sediment that clogs up the jets. It was just a, a lousy arrangement. So I just got to thinking there ought to be some better way of doing it. So. Uh, I thought about the fuel injection, and I drew up the first set of plans while I was uh, in the Army waiting to be discharged. In late um, 46, I had this finished. Engineers, professors from college, and engine experts, every one of them that looked at it after I explained how it would work, they'd say, it will work. So yeah. when we finally broke the record at uh, the dry lake, why, uh, I was pretty pleased because I had proved the experts were wrong. It had to be because the experts said it couldn't work. Yeah, every one of them said that. <laughs> so you had this streamliner. I decided I wanted to compare the uh, injector speed with the carburetor, and I was going to switch right at the lake. So I put on a conventional two-carburetor manifold like everybody was running. Running the streamliner with, with that carburetion system, you had this horrendous wreck. Well, what happened, uh, I started off pretty good, but uh, 
the lake bed that particular month uh, was kind of soft. And uh, when the lake bed is soft with the amount of power and the light weight we have in the car, the car has a tendency to do this when you're accelerating. Uh, usually uh, you can feel it come around and you just turn the wheel a little yeah. bit and save it. Yeah, control it. But in this case, uh, the rear end came around so far that the wire wheels on the right rear broke and that dropped the axle into the lake bed and dug in and I was just pulled all of the car and all, you know, head over heels, head over heels. Every time I landed on the lake bed on my back, the car was on top of me. And I must have bounced five or six times. Of course, you don't have a helmet on. I had a cloth helmet cloth on. Cloth helmet. <laughs> a cloth helmet. <laughs> and uh, no roll bars in those days. I had a safety belt. So that held me in, and I just hunched down as low as I could go. Unbelievable looking at those pictures that you could have possibly survived that accident. Well, I shouldn't have, really. Let's, let's talk about Indy. I mean, you revolutionized the whole scene at, at Indianapolis. Howard Keck, the owner of the car, hired what he called a hot shoe, which turned out to be Maury Rose. But Maury was a pretty aggressive driver, and we were pleased to have him. He qualified way up very close to the front. And he was very, very impressed. He said, that's the best running engine I've ever run. So he came into the garage after qualifying uh, when they were getting the car ready for the race. And he said, what are you doing putting the carburetors on? They said, well, we don't know if we'll run the 500 miles. And he says, you never will if you won't try it. So he, he made them take the He's carburetors off. He's the one that forced it. Yep. No kidding. He says, I, I don't want, ever want to run another carburetor. They switched over. and put the uh, injector on, and that became the first one that actually ran in the race. Although uh, we had uh, three or four others uh, decided to run it that same year. Maury finished very well in the race. He didn't win it, but he finished up there very well, so. How many times have cars with your injection system won Indy at this point? Well, 1952. That was the first one, and then, of course, the next year we won both of them. So that's three, and then we won 31 more. 31. Unbelievable. So we had a total of 34. Unbelievable. You know, God took the mind of a chemist and the passion of a hot rider and made <laughs> Stu Hillboard. And how blessed we are for the life you have led, Stu. It's just really special to be with you today. Well, Thanks for sharing. Glad you asked me. Don't you dare go away. When we return, we'll talk with Iski Cam's founder, Ed Iskandarian. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. After World War II, hot rodding in Southern California really began to boom, and the demand for parts was greater than the supply. Ed Iskandarian was looking for a very special camshaft to get more power on the dry lakes, but not one to wait. He took matters into his own hands and started his own business. Like Hillborn Fuel Injection, Isky Cams is still going strong today, and its namesake tells us how his passion was born. We are here with Ed Iskandarian, Mr. Camshaft himself. Ed, great to have you with us today. Oh, it's good to be here. Thank you. Ed, when did your love affair for cars first begin? Well, uh, when we first were over John Athens' house with the uh, Model T, we used to ride to school with that, to junior high school. We'd hang on the fenders. Wasn't enough room inside for all the kids to hang on. And that was where? Uh, in Los Angeles. Then, just by luck, uh, we got a visitor which was Jack Andrews and uh, Chuck Morrison in a real uh, gal job. The hot rod term hadn't been invented yet. Gal job, have you explained gal job? Gal job, it means go. It means kind of like go job. Lightweight, fast. When they came over, they really had a beautiful underslung Model T two-place car. And they, it put on such a show. When you went to crank it, why it spit back through the windfield carburetor and sprayed gasoline around and then it finally started and roared to life and and off they zoomed back down the street about 40 miles an hour in reverse <laughs> burning rubber all the way yeah and i thought gee <laughs> what could be more fun than that yeah. and that was it and that was it Sorry, that got me that. interested yeah what year oh that'd probably be about 36 7 something in there yeah wow then we started to build our own cars there in high school i uh we had to make some modification and need some machine work. We'd get to use the lathe. Before we got into the World War II, while we were making, started to make airplanes for England. So uh, we learned a little about, about machine work and tool and die making. And it was pretty good training, wasn't it? Yeah, so I had just the right amount, just enough to know about 
how to bluff my way in the cam grinding business after I got out of the <laughs> army. When I uh, first made my first cams, they, I had left off the clearance ramp and they were very noisy and I was ashamed of them because uh, I could hear them coming from a block away in a 32 roaster. This noisy cam of mine had more mid-range torque and uh, you could pass cars out on the racetrack. If a little spot opened up, you can touch the throttle and make a pass a car. And looking back over it, the people that are well established in a certain line of business, they are so busy usually filling their orders that they have no time to experiment. So in a way, a guy that has a new idea or something, he has time to do something special. We'll take Hilborn, for instance. He uh, had an idea for the, the injector, which uh, myself and a lot of other people didn't didn't think it would work. Didn't believe in it. Because it wasn't timed and uh, sophisticated <laughs> enough. And uh, no one else has got the time to work on. Established people are too busy just filling their orders and they don't get around to making anything new. So new people can always yeah. get started in business that as, way. As true today as it was back in the late 40s. Who were some of the individuals you used for advertising back in those days? Oh, Don Garlitz, of course. He, he bought his first cam for us, for his Chrysler. And he started doing uh, very good down in Florida. And I exploited him. I kind of teased the California racers with cry, uh, drag racers with this fellow <laughs> that's going fast back there. Because they'll in Florida. So they, they, it, it got to them in such a way that the Smokers Zoo Club in Bakersfield, they paid $1,500 to bring Garlitz out here. They wanted to to beat him, see. Well then, with all the write-ups and uh, mentions of you in Hot Rod Magazine and other books, and all of a sudden, ISKI cams are everywhere. I mean, if you wanted to have high performance, you wanted to have an ISKI cam in your car. That was the cool thing when I was growing up. Yeah, we, later on we got more competition, but at that time, we are dominating to some extent. Yeah. <laughs> well, here we sit today in the Bruce Meyer Hot Rod Gallery. Half these cars have your cams in them. Do you ever think these cars, the Hot Rods, would be pieces of art today at a museum oh, like yeah, the Peterson it's, it's Museum. It's become art, hasn't it? Yeah, people are trying to outdo each other today. Uh, they're just making them fancier and fancier. And you can yeah. believe the price of hot rods today. Oh, yeah. yeah, Hard to believe, yeah. Ed, it's so fascinating to hear your story. And, of course, I'm partial to family businesses. And here you have three sons yeah. uh, in the business and taking the load off you a little bit. You've got to right, kick yeah. back a little bit and have a little more fun. And uh, That's great right, to see yeah. you doing so well. Yeah, I still, uh, it's, uh, I'm still interested. Still a lot of mysterious things that I'd like to learn more about. Or s I don't know if we'll ever solve them, but we'll just learn, <laughs> find out what we've been doing wrong. There's probably, we're probably, it's probably something's right in front of our face and we don't see it. <laughs> I love it. You know, good ideas and stuff that we're just overlooking. Listen, it's almost 60 years after Ed started his camshaft business. He's still thinking of the new things that can correct the things he's done wrong and make yeah. them even better. Ed, Thanks it's so a great to be with you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Great. It's great to be, be with here. you always. Thank you very much. You're in for a real treat after this break as we celebrate Corvette's 50th with Corvette Day at the Peterson Automotive Museum. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. In 2003, the Corvette turned 50, and the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles threw a party to celebrate. We were there for Corvette Day, and my good friend Mike Yeager, president of Mid-America Design, sponsored this impressive show of force. This is significant. I mean, 50 years of making an automotive statement that has stayed the same. Fast speed, good looks, you know, America, horsepower. That's what Corvette is. We're estimating there's 350 Corvettes here today. When you go out to uh, hundreds to thousands of Corvette club members saying, gee, could you bring your Corvette down to uh, LA to the Peterson Automotive Museum and display it? We had a lot of hand raises. This car stirs up a lot of emotion in people. What an incredible event. Rain early in the day moved the event into the garage and indoors, but it couldn't dampen the enthusiasm of the Corvette faithful. America's sports car was well represented with one-offs, historic race cars, brand new Z06s, and Corvettes from every model year. 
We have arranged to have one of each of the 50-year Corvettes here. You can see transitional years, you can see evolution, and you can see revolutionary changes in the Corvette's history. We spoke with the owners of some of the best vets on display at the celebration. The 53 Corvette that you see here is number 119, and I don't want to be immodest, but I would say that it's probably the best 53 out there. I enjoy taking the car to Corvette shows all over. I believe that it should be shared with other enthusiasts because of its historic nature. My dad was a Chevrolet dealer, and he brought home one of the first 53 Corvettes for me to look at, and it was love at first sight when I was 10 years old, and it's really continued that way for 60 years. It's a 1962 Corvette. I graduated from the University of Colorado in 1962, and uh, that's what I wanted for a graduation present. My parents weren't very car crazy. Gave me General Motors stock instead. So about 15 years ago, I found this car, purchased it, and uh, I've had it ever since. 62 Corvette was the last year before the Stingray, and they only made this body style two years, in 1961 and 1962. It's fun to drive, it's fast, you get a lot of thumbs up. You know, Corvette's just America's sports car, and from that, I, I like the idea of having a little bit of Americana in my garage. The beginning of Corvette's second generation of cars was easily marked by the stunning 63 split window coupe. The split window here is in perfect condition. I do everything with this car. I've taken it on uh, rallies such as the Copper State 1000, which is in Arizona. It's a 1,000 mile driving event. I have taken it on, a, on another event called the California Classic. Numerous day trips. I drive it on Sundays through the hills around Malibu. It's, it's just really a lot of fun to drive. And the interesting thing is when you pull into a gas station, the reaction you get brings a smile to uh, everybody's face. One of the real showstoppers on display was the extremely rare 99 Callaway C12 Twin Turbo. My buddy Corvette Mike sat down to tell us all about it. This 1999 Callaway C12 Speedster is believed to be the only one in the United States today. The Callaway C12 is a total rebody of a C5 1999 Corvette. The actual track of the car has been widened. Both front and rear, the car takes on the look of an Aston Martin or a car of European flair. This car now resides in the Otis Chandler collection in Oxnard, California. Today's Corvette of choice is the Z06. It's a stunning blend of beauty and power that can compete with much more expensive cars. The Z06 came out with 405 horsepower. This particular car, they say, by all magazine standards, was the most bang for the buck. For a car that costs just over $50,000, it can compete with almost any supercar costing double to triple that amount of money. Turning 50 alongside the Corvette, Ray and Ely Jr. is celebrating with an awesome road trip through all 50 states. I had a museum delivery uh, April 23rd at the Bowling Green uh, plant. I left Friday the 25th at high noon. I was in Los Angeles uh, Wednesday at 1.30. We put the car in an airplane and we're in Hawaii Thursday morning. May 1st, we were in Hawaii for five hours. 107 miles this afternoon, yet I'm heading uh, north uh, and hopefully we'll be in Alaska next weekend and then continue the rest of my trip. Just gonna try to hit all 50 states and make an honest effort of it and it's be 21,000 miles in 61 days. Wow, what a tribute. Here's to another half century of America's sports car. We still have more of McGuire's Car Crazy. When we come back, we'll take a close look at BMW Films. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. BMW Films Hire Series is full of action-packed, heart-thumping, high-speed chases that star, what else? A BMW. We asked BMW's Jim McDowell about the initial concept of the series. We wanted to produce some entertainment that would be so exciting that people would come and see it and recommend it to their friends. We thought we could have a great future with short films, ones that have um, a beginning, a middle, and end, all in about eight minutes. This year's series features the all-new Z4, and with the car stealing almost every scene, sometimes it's easy to forget that there are some A-list stars on the screen as well. I never get to ride in the car. 
I only get to look at the car. But I've seen the film, and uh, it, it, you know, it should sell a lot of motor cars. I did get to sit near it, and I instantly felt like a sexier person, you know, just sort of sitting near it. It, it looks like a beautiful silver bullet. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> if there was any doubt about how the car would perform, up-and-coming director Joe Carnahan dispelled all disbelief. The car was fantastic. I mean, at the end of the shoot, uh, there was one, it was actually, I walked out of my trailer and there was a Z4 sitting there running, so I just kind of hopped in and took it for a spin up the hill. It's a great car, man. I'm a big, you know, proponent of BMW. I own one, so to be doing something for a product I so thoroughly believe in was great. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was selling out. The car has just got guts and it just has a certain kind of, you know, persona, if you will, that, you know, it's just a great looking kind of roadster. And so we didn't really have to work that hard. We just shot it and put it on film and it took care of the rest. And how does the hardest working man in showbiz feel about performing in the BMW Hire Series? I feel good because I'm very blessed to be here. Thank God for this. Ow! <laughs> If you're certifiable, send us a video of yourself by your car telling us just how car crazy you really are. The best videos become part of a new segment on this show. All entries will become the property of McGuire's Car Crazy. For more details, go to carcrazycentral.com. Well, that's all for now. This is such a treat for me to share some of the great people of my life with you. Hope you've enjoyed as much as we have, and I hope these stories will make you just a little bit more Car Crazy. Thanks for watching. Car Crazy has been brought to you by the Meguiar's family of appearance car care products. Meguiar's, the trusted experts in surface care since 1901.